A U.S. District Court judge in Alabama has ruled that a predominantly white town in that state could separate itself from its otherwise racially mixed school district. Judge Madeline Hykela stated in her ruling last week, and we quote, race was a motivating factor in Gardendale's decision to separate from the Jefferson County public school system. The record demonstrates that some Gardendale citizens are concerned because the racial demographics in Gardendale are shifting, and they worry that Gardendale may become, become a predominantly black city. These citizens prefer a predominantly white city. End of quote. Now, despite these findings, Judge Hakela granted permission of the suburb outside of Birmingham, which is 88 percent white, to take over control of the four schools within their borders. Now, this practice of white towns separating from this Alabama district, which is 42 percent black, has become rampant in the last several years. In fact, Gardendale is the 12th district to become independent. Joining us here in studio to talk about this is Todd Cox, Director of Policy at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Welcome. Glad to have you here. You know, it's interesting, most of the time the debate around issues like this is whether or not there is actual discrimination That's going right. on. This time the judge says, oh no, there's discrimination, but I'm going to allow this anyway. That's right. And I think the, the quote you read uh, really captures it. Uh, the judge found there was intent to discriminate. This decision was tainted with racial discrimination. Nevertheless, she said that we're going to allow this split to occur, the separation to occur, and require the, the uh, Gardendale to prove that it can run on desegregated Right, it's going to system. require them to move forward with their own desegregation. That's correct. Plan. That's yeah. correct. But take that high school with them, that $51 million state-of-the-art high school that was created within uh, the, their boundaries by the county, take that with them. Yeah. Now, do you think that the, the fact that uh, the, the judge said she didn't want the black kids to be blamed for any continuing, uh, I guess, uh, if they were, if the, 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 the move to separate was turned down, does that hold any water at all for you? Well, it reflects a sensitivity. I think this judge, and, and let me just say, it's difficult to square the remedy with what the judge found, obviously. But it reflects some sensitivity that she had to both the kids being blamed, but to whatever she considered legitimate concerns that parents had that required the split to occur. But I think it's important to remember that she lifted up the primacy of Brown, the need to uh, to, to remedy past discrimination. And uh, we're, we're confident that once we uh, have another conversation with the judge or opportunity to advocate before the judge that she'll uh, reverse her you opinion. Know, this judge is an Obama appointee, correct? As far as I understand. So it, she seemed to be sympathetic to the argument, but it's also a matter of law in the state that cities are allowed to do this, right? That's correct, but they aren't allowed to do it uh, in, in a way that abrogates uh, their requirement not to not to discriminate and to uh, to their requirements under this consent decree to desegregate. Were there any other reasons that this this district might have wanted to separate it from Jefferson County? Was it, in other words, could there have been some class issues? Was there anything else involved? Well, I mean, I think there there are some certain some proxy issues. Uh, I think there are some folks who were concerned about or wanted to uh, have some independence. Um, but I think the judge found all of those issues, or many of them, to be just proxies for discrimination. And she had very powerful language uh, and findings that we were very happy with. Could this have happened outside of the Deep South? I mean, would you have the same argument, let's say, if it was uh, a district in Manhattan, for example? It could have happened other places. But I think the, the South, and particularly Alabama, are unique. Mm. Um, we have a lot of cases, mostly in the Deep South, under consent decrees where Brown is still yet to be, uh, its, its, its prominence and its, its, its requirements are yet to be fulfilled. So I think it's, it's a unique situation that's, that's, that's unfortunately uh, characterized a lot, a lot in the South. All right, so where do we go from here? How optimistic are you that this could be changed? Or is this going to go forward and you just have to hope to win the next one? <laughs> well, we're going to hopefully revisit this with the judge. Uh, we, again, are, are pleased with her findings of discrimination. We think those are powerful. And her understanding of the importance of Brown. So we think once we have another opportunity to go before her that she can reconcile and hopefully square uh, her findings of intentional discrimination with her remedy. You know, it is fascinating that we're having this conversation in 2017, but and disheartening. And well. disheartening, yeah. particularly in this uh, administration. All right, Todd Cox, <laughs> thanks so much. Thank we you. Appreciate Pat. it. Let's get back to our panel. I'm sure you might be a little disheartened that we're having this conversation in 2017. Yeah, and what it, what it comes to for me is just, you know, we had a conversation about federal protections earlier. This is why you need federal protections. This is why you cannot allow states and localities to just go off on their own and to um, just go and indiscriminately make decisions like this. You still need the protection of the federal government. We talked about with the police shootings. There are still issues that the federal government does need to come in and needs to protect citizens from their states. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have a question. Do you think that this particular rule 
ruling is something that might be replicated in other areas? I mean, do you think that this will spread like a virus? Well, it's, it's always a concern, which is why we want to get this right. Um, we want to obviously focus in on what the judge found. Number one, that Brown is the importance and primacy of Brown. The Brown is obviously still something that needs to be complied with. But also her, her painstakingly uh, analytical uh, a review of the findings that, that discrimination occurred. So uh, we want to make sure we, when we go back to her that we rec make sure we reconcile those findings with her remedy so that the, the, this, this opinion is not replicated throughout well, the South. Well, you know, it's interesting because it, as we turn back to Todd Cox, is there, uh, was she constrained by the law? I mean, could she, was she in essence saying, I'd like to do something else, but this is what the law says I have to do? We don't think so. I mean, we, we think that, in fact, the law supports our position. Uh, if you go back in the history of this case, there were a, a so-called school choice options on the table. And specifically in the, in the line of cases that led up to where we are now, in this specific case, the courts rejected that. Mm -hmm. So this notion that, um, that, that, that parents uh, of children get to choose to opt out of desegregation plans but something that the court uh, has always rejected. All right, back to the panel. Yeah, definitely. And I want to say to your point, um, no one was saying that there should not be any federal protection. This is definitely an opportunity for that. But as you mentioned, this is something that's not just isolated to this one incident. It's a growing trend. Last year, under Obama administration, the Government Accountability Office released a report showing that segregation in schools is a growing trend. Six two years after Brown v. Board. And so this is a growing trend, not just in the South. I'm in Maryland. Our schools are being <laughs> predominantly segregated by a class as well. And it's an issue that we need to address. One of the big factors here, though, is also segregation by housing. I mean, more mm -hmm. and more people don't live in neighborhoods that are integrated. If you're not in an integrated neighborhood, it's hard to argue for an integrated school. Well, this is not new. I mean, mm -hmm. and the reality is that statistically speaking, interestingly, uh, the uh, South tends to be more integrated in their schooling than the North yeah. has been post-Brown. I mean, that's just the reality. We have a very ugly history in this country as it relates to school desegregation. We had years of massive resistance where children were being mobbed in terms of integrating schools, and there has always been this hatred. And this is just basically the, the sort of bubbling up of it. So, once the, again. so the question would be, why hasn't it gotten better? Why isn't it getting better? Well, one of the reasons it's not getting better is because President Trump nominated Ben Carson to be his Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and one of the first things he did was to break down a lot of the Obama protections uh, for uh, housing. I mean, and also you look at the Trump budget. I mean, but housing segregation predates Trump. I mean, exactly. I mean, yes. but, but the attitude that this, pervades yeah. right now, there's a, there, there's a very pervasive attitude that says, this is okay. I really do think that this is an attitude thing where people feel like the Trump presidency and, and, and I keep coming back lunch. to the Republicans and saying, you know, we don't have to be politically correct anymore. Exactly. Right? And, I, and I know it's in style to attack Trump, and I know there's plenty of things we can talk about, but this issue, as you said, has predated the last three months of Trump's presidency. And to your point, it's kind of baked into the cake. When you have public schools where you're assigned based on your zip codes and our neighborhoods are becoming more and more segregated, you're going to end up with schools which are predominantly black and uh, sometimes lower funded and schools that are predominantly white and higher funded. So it's kind of baked in the cake when you do the public school system based on zip code. And is, so, is it, how should we? How should it be done? If I mean, you, there's, there's people different. People want to go to schools that are in their neighborhood. Yeah, they, they, they do. They do. Um, I'll say, you know, public charter schools is an option. I know in uh, Chicago, there's Urban Prep that made news recently. It's an all-black school that is um, getting some higher rates. So I don't know what the solution is. I mean, it's an issue that we've been fighting over 62 years well, since we've Black had, Board. We've had a history of uh, understanding how to desegregate schools. Right. I mean, you have busings. You have other ways in which you do it. Um, but the reality is that we still have a culture of massive resistance when mm. it comes to integration. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take laws and people aggressively uh, enforcing those laws in order to change. And that. while I agree that the pres that this is not this predates the last three months, I will say there is an emboldening, right? There is something about a, an administration that says this is okay. We're you know we're 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 saying to people, hey, this is this type of attitude, this type of action is okay. Mm -hmm. We support that. I do think that's an effect. Mm -hmm. I really wish we could solve this one right now. A but peaceful protest turned deadly. Thirty-seven year old black man was shot. Mm -hmm. Killed by Baton Rouge police. Your hands are in the air and you still get shot by the cops. Oh my God, please don't tell me he's dead. We're not going to let hate define us. Race is a big part of this. If truly all lives matter, then all lives need to matter equally. What we require is action. What we require is accountability. We understand that black lives do matter. And we will keep focused on this issue. News One Now, every weekday morning at 7 on TV One.